Okay, uh, thank you for connecting back on this session. Uh, we're talking about uh, the prophetic anointing in the Old Testament. We've gained some insights. Uh, we were talking about the fact that there were schools for the prophets that were established by Samuel, uh, which continued on even through the times of uh, people like Elijah and Elisha. And from what we see uh, in the Old Testament, there was probably a headquarters of the school of prophets somewhere in Gilgal. Uh, and you have uh, other places that are mentioned, like Bethel, Jericho, where uh, these trainees would have stayed um, and they would have picked up various uh, truths about the prophetic anointing. Now, these trainees, for whatever reason, they are called as servants, maybe because they uh, spent a lot of time with the mentors. Uh, it's something like you know Jesus' times where the disciples stayed with Jesus, learned the ways of Jesus, uh, so on and so forth. But you know, uh, maybe this was another level higher where they assisted the mentors to actually uh, be equipped by them. So that's how they were uh, prepared. That's how you could say that they were trained into seasoned prophets. Okay, So the gift, why does the gift need to uh, be mentored or uh, why does the give we why do we need to instruct people on the gift you see these are questions we can ask but even under the old testament if somebody was anointed to be a prophet uh, there were mentors who helped them mature and uh, be groomed into seasoned prophets so there is a place basically what we are saying is there's a place for uh, human effort or equipping or training to some extent, right? To help uh, grow and develop the prophetic gift uh, and you know, flow ahead. So that is again something that we learn. Now, uh, having learned that there were mentors or there were teachers for the prophetic, uh, we mustn't make the mistake of insisting at all times that there be a mentor. If there's no mentor, then how is one going to grow in the prophetic anointing? Because you look at the example of Samuel. Samuel, uh, practically, he did not have uh, the kind of equipping he needed to be that mighty prophet. But you see, God was enough for him. So if at all somebody, for some reason, maybe they don't have a, a, a seminar that they can go to or, uh, you know, uh, they, they don't have that equipping around them, they can still develop the gift with the work of God in their lives. And we've been talking about the Holy Spirit and his ministry in our lives. And so uh, mentor or no mentor, we can develop in the gift, but it's always helpful to have some sort of an equipping and training. Okay, So that is what we gain from what we have just seen regarding the school of the prophets. Now, moving right along, uh, the prophetic influence. I made a quick mention of this earlier, uh, but I will elaborate on it. There's something known as the prophetic influence. And again, just to remind all of us, I'm not talking only about prophecy. Okay, prophecy is a now word from God, but more than that, even the prophetic anointing, right? Uh, there can be a flow of this prophetic anointing that can uh, you know touch another person so we we see this in the old testament and i'll explain uh, further there are instances like the one that i mentioned to us uh, earlier where saul encountered the company of prophets or the uh, school of the prophets the sons of the prophets and though he carried a kingly anointing uh, temporarily he prophesied. We don't read about him prophesying, um, you know, ever again, in, like in the capacity of, uh, of a prophet or anything. But he could temporarily, when he came in the zone of the prophets. Now, think about um, Moses. Okay? 
Moses at some point, like uh, every good leader, every uh, sincere leader, he did his very best for the people. And uh, the burdens of ministry was, you know, very heavy upon him that he came to a place where he was pleading with the Lord to even kill him. He's like, God, enough. I can't manage all these people. Uh, and, and so, you know, just finish me off. Uh, that's my prayer to you. So it's interesting to know that uh, a leader like Moses, a mighty leader like Moses came to that point uh, in his life. But you know, thank God for his uh, faithfulness, his wisdom and his grace that the Lord ministered to Moses. The Lord, uh, you know, helped him understand uh, that he can have a solution in this particular dead end situation. And that is to have leaders under him. So the instruction uh, that God gave Moses was to have 17 leaders, uh, call them like uh, call them uh, to a, a particular place, and that God would pour out the spirit which he had poured out on Moses on these 70 leaders. Then what would happen? The 70 leaders also would be equipped to lead these thousands of uh, uh, people who were moving along with Moses. Now, the interesting part is that Moses called all these 70 elders and then you know, God uh, released his spirit upon them. In Numbers 11, 25, we read that when the spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied, although they never did so again. So we learn that God put the anointing, okay, which was on Moses, on these people. Now, if you study a little bit more about the kind of anointing that God actually put on these 70 elders, it was more of a leadership anointing. Okay, when we talk about em anointing is what empowering by the spirit of God, uh, uh, the, the carrying the presence of God, you know, with its power. Uh, so Moses had this leadership anointing, okay, with, of course, the prophetic anointing, because we know prophet Moses, that's how he's referred to. So he had the prophetic anointing on his life. But when the anointing which was on Moses was poured out on the 70 elders, God's intention was to distribute or give the leadership anointing for the people, on the people, because that's what they need to lead thousands of others. However, notice here, that once, what also happened is they prophesied. Okay, what is this? What's happening? There is an influence because Moses carries the prophetic anointing, though the leaders are not necessarily, you know, in that a position of a prophet, there's an influence of the prophetic anointing because of Moses and they prophesied. And not just that, not just that. As we read, read further, Numbers 11 verse 26, there are two elders who did not show up in this particular gathering. They were elsewhere. Uh, in the, they remained in the camp, it says, elded and made it. And when the Lord poured out his spirit on these uh, leaders who had gathered, even these men who were somewhere in the camp, scriptures say that they also prophesied. Okay, so what's happening? There's a connect, some sort of an influence. Why are we calling it influence? Because, uh, you know, it, it was there for a bit and then it was gone. So momentarily, uh, that prophetic anointing was seen. But we cannot deny the fact that there was the evidence of the flow of the prophetic anointing, even if it was temporary. So what can we uh, gain from this? We can gain that in a prophetic environment, okay, or uh, in this case, you know, Moses and uh, these people who were associated, you know, sometimes they say association, there can be that gift can sort of come and move upon others. It can influence others who may not directly you know, be uh, a part of that anointing by themselves. Uh, so when we talk about this prophetic environment, in today's times, how does it work? 
see something like i will i will tell you uh, maybe a believer wants to learn about the prophetic so they start reading some books on the prophetic there can be an influence you see what's happening the anointing which is upon the ministry the anointing which is upon the book it can begin to be stirred up in the life of that believer simply because they are reading a book or you know maybe they are listening to sermons on the prophetic or maybe they are participating in um, you know a conference that has to do with the prophetic or a weekend school that has to do with the prophetic what's happening the flow of the anointing can touch their lives because somebody is carrying it okay and, and that is what we are referring to as the influence so it can uh, touch others lives it can be stirred up in others it can be released through them but of course uh, you see one would need to continue to develop that gift if they want to consistently flow in it uh, and you know consistently demonstrate the power of god through the prophetic anointing okay um, so in a congregation setting uh, or in a group setting it's a good thing for us uh, as believers today to know that something there is something known as a prophetic influence as a congregation if we flow in the anointing you see quite easily people will be stirred up to flow uh, in the prophetic anointing okay? so that is how we can apply it in our lives today now uh, continuing uh, from here we will talk a little bit about transfer of the prophetic anointing so okay you know they may sound very technical but just get an understanding of what these things are so what is the transfer you see uh, the example of moses that we talked about moses had 70 elders so god took the anointing which he had poured uh, the spirit that rested on moses that's how it is explained the spirit that rested on Moses, he put it on the 70 elders. So what's happening? There is, you can call it a transfer of the anointing from Moses on the leaders. The transfer of the anointing. Now, of course, another thing that we have to clarify here is when we say transfer, in this very example, the 70 leaders become many Moses. They did not become prophets like Moses. They just had what they needed. So the anointing will work in line with the grace of God upon our lives. And we've discussed this in uh, when we studied about you know, uh, supernatural. So they needed wisdom. They needed leadership abilities. So when the transfer happened, it's not like a 100% transfer. The parts which the leaders needed, that part got transferred to them. And from that point on, they were able to flow in the leadership anointing. And momentarily, of course, they prophesied. So that's how it is. So there are uh, newer terms that are used in the body of Christ now, terms like impartation. Okay, uh, This is all kind of new language that people use. But that's the same understanding. The anointing which was on somebody's life, it's kind of being transferred on to other people's lives and they are receiving it and they are flowing in it. Okay? So that's how the transfer takes place. Another example. Another example would be Moses and Joshua, his successor. Now, there is a, a, a scripture that says that Moses laid hands on Joshua. So basically what he's doing is that spirit which he carried, so he wanted Joshua to have it. Uh, and similar, very similar to what I said. What did Joshua need? What was the call of uh, God on Joshua's life? Leadership. So the spirit of wisdom right, and that ability to lead was what was actually transferred, or if you want to call it, imparted upon Joshua. And uh, he could move uh, in that particular anointing, but not necessarily you know, the fullness of the prophetic anointing, the way it was demonstrated through Moses' life, the prophetic songs and the supernatural demonstrations. That was not the case for Joshua. It was somewhat different. So transference can actually happen. And um, uh, in, in what we have seen so far, we've, we've seen a transference uh, as far as the work of God is concerned. So you know, leaders, 
transferring, praying for the transference of the anointing upon those who are following, you know, under them, who are leading under them. So that way we've seen the transference happen. Now think about Elijah and Elisha, a classic example where uh, Elisha is, uh, you know, he's literally chasing his mentor. He's going, he's like, I'm not going to leave this uh, prophet. Uh, so he's sticking with him from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. Um, and he was, the reason why Elisha was doing this as a son of a prophet or a servant is because he had seen the fullness of the prophetic anointing upon Elijah's life. And we know the story that he really desired a double portion of the anointing which was on Elijah. So when he's asked, when he's desiring double portion of anointing from Elijah, what is that? The same thing, right? Taking the spirit which was on Elijah and putting it on Elisha, transfer, impartation. We use those terms. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Elisha even makes it clear to Elijah that this is what I want. I want a uh, double portion. So in 2 Kings 2, 9, Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Okay. So, wow, what a question you know, that uh, uh, Elisha asked Elijah. Now, how is uh, Elijah going to respond to this? So verse 10, we see Elijah says, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. But, you know, it's it's perplexing. It's, it, it's um, confusing why uh, Elijah said this. Why couldn't have Elijah simply said, okay, great, Elisha, uh, I'm so impressed that uh, um, you desire great things in the kingdom. Come on, have the double push. See, one truth which Elijah, as a mighty prophet of God, understood is anointing is from God. So even the anointing in which Elijah was flowing, right? We discussed, we enlisted some of the miracles earlier. It was not something that Elijah was able to make and uh, manufacture and release by himself. So Elijah knew the truth that anointing of God, empowering of God you know, by the spirit, it has to directly come from God. There is no question of human beings taking what they have and giving it on some, giving it to somebody. See, if it was that simple that you know we can give the anointings we have to one another and double it and triple it and all, what would we do? We would desire it for ourselves. So if I have X amount of anointing and uh, laying hands can double that anointing, wouldn't I lay hands on my own head and double and triple and you know make it four times and twenty times and all that because we desire greater anointing, but anointing cannot be transferred like that. You see, it has to come from God. And Elijah knew that. That's why he said, Elisha, I'm impressed by what you like and what you want in your life. But you've asked a very hard thing. You've asked a very hard thing. Uh, but one thing, maybe God impressed it on Elijah's heart. Uh, Maybe God wanted to test Elisha's obedience. And so he said, look, uh, nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So uh, he gives him this clause and says, OK, if you happen to continue to follow me, then it'll come from heaven on your life. You want double portion? God is willing and God will give it to you. So when we talk about transfer, we have to understand this very clearly. Okay. Anointing, even though transfers happen, impartation happens, who is the source? God is the source. We are not here to, you know, um, take and give and multiply anointings on each other. Of course, by faith, we can pray. There are scriptures in the New Testament where um, we can impart what we have, uh, you know, uh, by the Spirit to others. But, you know, there is that limitation to it. The, actual flow has to really come from God. Okay, uh, And OK, what are the other some of the other lessons we can learn from uh, this particular incident? We can learn that 
uh, God wants us to have focus. So Elijah told Elijah, uh, as long as you're following me, keep your eyes on me. You'll get what you are desiring. So see, there were all supernatural distractions around Elijah when uh, Elisha, when Elijah was carried away in a chariot, you know, there he could have put his eyes on many things. There was a chariot, there were horses of fire, there was a whirlwind, there was open heaven. But obviously, he would have kept his eyes on Elijah as much as possible and not even be distracted by the supernatural distraction. So that is one thing we see. What is the other thing we can understand? Very encouraging part is anointing. Multiple times the anointing. Is that a possibility? It's possible. Uh, desiring the anointing on somebody's life, is that a possibility? Yes. When we see, oh, wow, see how so-and-so is flowing. I would like to have that or I would like to flow. It's okay to desire good things, okay? And God doesn't stop us from doing it. But of course, we've learned very well that the anointings that we finally end up uh, receiving are the ones which are aligned to the grace of God, the gifts of God for our own life. So we cannot replicate the ministry of a so-called man of God or a woman of God. So uh, two things here, one is focus. Okay, not even be distracted by supernatural distractions. And second uh, is that portions of the anointing, even multiple times, uh, that's something we can desire, we can receive. And uh, really, Elisha and his life as a prophet, a minister of God, as far as the ministry is concerned, uh, we can be so encouraged because when we read his the miracles that took place through Elisha's life, uh, there are double the number of miracles associated with Elisha's ministry as compared to Elijah's. So in a way, God is showing us, see, he got what he desired. Okay, and God actually gave it to him. So double twice the number of miracles are recorded in the ministry of uh, Elisha, the successor of Elijah. Okay. Now, continuing to talk about transference. The, minute, the anointing that somebody carries, you know, uh, God put it on others, uh, some desired it and even received it. Now, these are all people who lived in the same time duration. Okay. What about the transfer of the anointing across time zones? Okay. I'm simply saying, you know, time zones or uh, across generations. Is that a possibility? It is a possibility. We read in Luke 1.17, okay, this is describing John the Baptist. The Bible says, John the Baptist, he came in the spirit and power of who? Elijah. Elijah lived so many hundreds of years behind John the Baptist. What is the kind of anointing that John the Baptist is carrying in Jesus' times? The spirit and the power of Elijah. Notice? So, transference of the anointing can happen across centuries, even across generations. Okay? Um, and that is an indication you know, we are receiving here. We are not being told that Elijah has again come. There are other scriptures that talk about, you know, um, Elijah has already come. And then uh, in Malachi, we know that in a future time again, Elijah this promise that he will come again. So Elijah didn't come back. Elijah didn't come back. But the anointing, the spirit and power, what is it referring to? The anointing of Elijah. Centuries later, it was carried and it was put over. So people talk about uh, mantles. Mantles, what is that? Mantles is a way, again, of describing the anointing that covered one person. Now that is flowing. It's covering another person. Okay, So those mantles or those anointings and the giftings that we see in times past, we can desire and we can walk in it now. So maybe we are reading about uh, some men and women of God who did powerful ministry. Don't stop yourself from desiring. We see good things. It's it's a uh, it's a beautiful thing to desire it. Say, wow, God, 
you know, I love the way in which uh, the prophetic is flowing through their lives. I love the way in which uh, healing is, is being demonstrated through this person's life and the story uh, that this person is sharing. I would like to have it, God. So, you know, we can have these prayers in our hearts. And who is to say what God can take from uh, from the anointing of people of times past and then, you know, put uh, some of it on our lives. So anointing can definitely be transferred. Okay, uh, But again, reiterating, we cannot duplicate what has happened. There can be uh, another expression of the same anointing. Okay, But these dimensions also exist in the uh, prophetic. So that is what we gain from this whole transference of uh, the anointing. Okay? Now let's uh, continue. We see in the Old Testament that there was uh, a level of prophetic ministry towards leaders, towards rulers. So there were kings, um, especially David. David is a classic example uh, who related with so many seers. So then you have all these names, Nathan, Gad. Okay? These are the king's seers. They had a need to hear from God, uh, and which is why they associated with prophets. Okay? And instruction came, they followed along. So there are many such names of prophetic, um, you know, prophets, Heman, Jeduthun. God used all these prophets in uh, the life of David. You know, we talked about the correction also that came to David through Nathan. So how did all of these people live their lives? Um, we, we talk about the tabernacle of David, remember? Uh, a place of intercession, a place of continual worship. So they, ha they had dedicated their lives to seeking the Lord and uh, in the presence of God and just by serving God in worship, uh, you know, they, they, received, they received the anointing and they flowed in this prophetic anointing. And they continued to um, support and assist the king uh, with by hearing from God and giving him the um, uh, insights that he needed. So in times past, we have uh, seen this kind of a ministry where prophets uh, hear from God and they communicate to leaders, uh, they communicate to kings. So that is something that can happen even today. Okay, and God uh, can have men and women of God uh, who hear from him. Now, how do we apply it? Yes, we will have people in the church. So when I say in the church, they can be notable prophets who are called prophets who might go up to kings and say, thus says the Lord. But we can also have, uh, you know, when we talked about uh, the gift of prophecy, we said that all believers can flow in the gift of prophecy and they can use it uh, in line with what God is doing in their life. So what about people who are in the marketplace. They might be CEOs, they might be, you know, uh, financial officers, they, they might be in leading positions of power, but they hear from God, even an instruction from them. It might not be said like, thus says the Lord, it might be in the form of, um, you know, hey, uh, I have done this research, uh, have a look, these are the conclusions, maybe this is the direction in which we should go, or it might be in the form of a presentation, uh, or, it, you know, it, it could come in a different way, which we don't call, you know, this is a prophecy, but God can work, God can release his instruction into the lives of leaders through um, the prophetic even today. So, uh, you know, this is something that we learn from the Old Testament. So, and, and there are many other examples as well. You had people like Moses, Moses going to Pharaoh, Elijah, you remember uh, Jezebel, Ahab. So they were also kind of uh, uh, in times when there were kings and was a certain ministry uh, which they were doing. In the New Testament, John the Baptist, you know, you, to see how he was communicating to the Herod uh, dynasty. So, um, yeah, such prophets uh, existed and continue to exist. And uh, their work can range from uh, encouragement, instruction, direction to even 
warnings okay so we've seen that in the old testament they even brought warnings okay now coming to the next subject here associated with the prophetic anointing so whenever we see the uh, prophetic demonstrating itself powerfully we also notice a strong demonic opposition okay somehow I, I, we are not saying that uh, you know one should get scared that oh uh, satan will always try to oppose it may or may not happen but we do see instances of demonic opposition you know uh, when prophetic ministry takes place in the old testament why is this we know that satan is interested in counterfeit if god has the genuine what will Satan try to do? He'll try to come up with a counterfeit. So the prophetic anointing is from God. It's perfect. It's genuine. It's powerful. So what has Satan done? He's come up with a counterfeit. Looks like what God is doing, but obviously it's not the authentic part of God. So what do these things look like? The counterfeit to the prophetic ministry it looks like witchcraft looks like divination you know by by demonic spirits um, saying a word releasing a prophetic word over people or a community or a nation divination we call it the spirit of divination fortune telling okay fortune telling but the source is different it's not God who is releasing these words remember Deuteronomy 13 what is the test of a prophetic word not that it's coming to pass. Wonderful that if somebody said something and it got fulfilled, that's great. But the real test of a genuine word from God is, is it drawing me closer to God or is it drawing me to other things? So that is the most important test. And when you look at the counterfeit that Satan creates, it will create confusion. You know, it'll bring, uh, it, it'll take people away from God. Uh, it will obviously, you know, as you follow those instructions, it leads to uh, destruction and calamity. So he must steer clear of the counterfeit. So this is how he uh, does things. So there, to some extent, we might see a demonstration of power and we might get scared like, Are, how is it happening? Uh, sorry for that array. That's a Hindi word for the international people. Uh, okay. So what I'm saying is, like, we might be startled. That how can Satan demonstrate the power? Uh, but you see, it's all temporary. It's all not to the the extent that God demonstrates his, his power. It's just like a, a look, look alike, feel feel like the work of God and power. So what are some examples we see? More Yes. goes uh, to Pharaoh's the, the magicians of Egypt and uh, whatever uh, Moses was doing, the magicians were able to do their words. Uh, and you know, it could have been quite intimidating for Moses to see this. Thank God you know, he stayed on with the instruction of God. And ultimately, even though the sorcerers, which is able to demonstrate, uh, Counterfeit miracles, counterfeit signs, just the way Moses was doing it. In the end, Moses' rod, you know, it, uh, it, it, it gobbled up the other snakes there. So God showed his triumph. God's power ultimately triumphs. Okay? So that is how God displayed his glory. And think about you know, uh, all the other miracles that took place through Moses' life. The sorcerers during his time were kind of able to convince uh, the Pharaoh by uh, a few signs and wonders that they could do. Similarly, when we go to the times of uh, Elijah, Elijah, okay, there was opposition. Elijah is a mighty prophet of God, uh, moving in all these signs, wonders, and miracles, but we are told that in his times, the authorities, Ahab and Jezebel, you know, they, um, uh, they had a kingdom 
that promoted and supported um, certain prophets. These were the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah, and they were involved in witchcraft. They were involved in, uh, you know, black magic. And scriptures say uh, harlotries and witchcraft uh, filled the land. Right? Just will fill the land with all these things. Just think about it. So there is the genuine power, the prophetic anointing of God at work through Elijah in that land. But you have an opposing so-called strong forces of uh, the demonic world also at work in the same land. What a crazy time to be alive. What a crazy time to be a prophet, Elijah. It wasn't easy. It was a very tough task that Elijah had. That through his life, the prophetic anointing demonstrated boldness, authority, power, the way he, he um, uh, uh, took up that challenge on Mount Gamma. So cool, isn't it? Like he said, yeah, I put water in front of him. And the, the entire time, uh, these other prophets were crying out to their gods and this and that, nothing happened. But uh, Elijah just, you know, he called fire and it came, even the wet wood was consumed by it. Um, so the glory of God was demonstrated in an amazing way through the prophetic anointing that worked out of Elijah's life. So that is what we must uh, understand. There can be demonstrations from the demonic world, but don't be overwhelmed. You know, don't, don't get worried about it because God's power triumphs it all. God's power is victorious and greater. And so that's what we want to press into. And thank God people like Moses and Elijah, they had that understanding. Okay, we will not be intimidated, but we will stand with the power of God. But you see, um, in the case of Elijah, there were some challenges. You know, I mentioned that um, Jezebel was trying to promote all these uh, um, ungodly activities. So there were some spirits at work, isn't it? Even after the Mount Carmel experience, we found that somewhere um, Elijah, he was affected by what Jezebel was doing. So he generally terms as Jezebel's spirit. What is Jezebel's spirit? See, Jezebel's spirit is a collective term for the kind of um, uh, kind of work that the demon spirits were doing during those times. What were they doing? So they were involved. So these are like lying spirits, spirits of witchcraft, spirits of deception, spirits of seduction. You know? They were uh, they were some sort of controlling spirits, manipulating spirits, provoking spirits, spying spirits. So that collective term for the spirits who perform these activities is known as Jezebel spirit. Okay, so that is our that is the actual understanding of that uh, term Jezebel spirit. So she was promoting all these demonic spirits, and somewhere, you know, Elijah faced maybe at some point uh, as an individual, he he was overwhelmed by the manipulation and the intimidation these spirits were causing. But thank God. For his grace. We read later on in those passages how beautifully God led Elijah. God restored him both spiritually and also physically and sent him back on his assignment. So, what is the understanding we gain? Is it the demonic opposition? Okay, we're not just saying things that yeah, there can be demonic. It was very real that even a prophet like Elijah, he overcame many times. There was one point where it was tough for him uh, to actually overcome these intimidating spirits. But thank God, you know, God still broke through in his life. And that's the power of uh, uh, God's God's supernatural glory upon us. So, uh, you know, in this way, we, we kind of uh, understand. Again, there's a mention of the same Jezebel spirit in Revelation chapter 2, when uh, God addresses a local church of uh, Thyatira, and there also, you know, God commends them for some their love, service, endurance, and work. But uh, He rebukes them. He says, "You uh, tolerate this woman Jezebel." Okay, uh, and, uh, she calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed. So you see what is happening. 
the work of Jezebel, or if you want to call it the ministry of Jezebel, is leading to some ungodly thing. She calls herself a prophetess, but what is it leading the people to do? Sexual immorality, eating uh, food sacrificed to idols, seducing. So that spirit is not from God, isn't it? So just because somebody is saying they are, I'm a prophet, we have to see the fruit. And God is addressing that matter. He's saying that spirit is not the right spirit because it's leading to ungodly things, you know, witchcraft and uh, seducing and um, sacrificing to idols, sexual immorality. So God is saying, hey, deal with that spirit or deal with that demonic influence. That is the understanding. Okay, that we gain from this word Jezebel. Just clarify Jezebel, Jezebel spirit, it refers to such things. So uh, are you all doing okay? I think it's all this is too interesting. I don't know what you feel, mm -hmm. but I'm enjoying my class, our class. <laughs> okay, so hope you're all doing fine. Uh, let me just pause for a moment. Any comments, points for discussion, questions? Okay, Divya says interesting. Yes, yes, very interesting. Very interesting. Mm. Okay, another uh, interesting story is coming up. Uh, so let's let's move on. Maybe I'll use up all the time to uh, describe this next situation. In First Kings chapter thirteen, okay, there is an incident about a prophet. He's from Judah, uh, and he went to prophesy to King Jeroboam. What happens is uh, uh, he prophesies, and you know King Jeroboam is angry, so he stretches out uh, his hand towards him uh, to sort of you know rebuke, apprehend the prophet, uh, but his hand withers, okay? and he's not able to pull it back. But anyway, you know God uh, quickly Jeroboam repents, and his hand is restored, uh, and all that, and. Once that is done, the king um, invites the prophet. So this prophet from Judah, the king invites him and says, OK, come, why don't you have some refreshment? I'll give you a reward. Now, this prophet, he has uh, instructed by God, uh, he refuses both the refreshments and the reward. So uh, you know, basically, uh, we, we read here, in First Kings 13, verses 8 through 10, his response to the king. Uh, but the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to. So seems like you know one of those trainee prophets who is following the instructions of his mentors. Okay, let's be obedient. Let's focus. No distractions. So once he finished his prophetic assignment, the king is inviting him. Come eat with me. And he says, No, no, no. I have to be obedient. God said, Don't eat. Don't drink. So I'm going back. Was he obedient? Yes, he was obedient. But as we read the passage, you know, later. We see that uh, another prophet, okay, uh, likely a more senior prophet, he comes to meet this uh, prophet from Judah and he sort of convinces him to have a meal with him. He says, okay, come, let's go have a meal together. Unfortunately, what does this junior prophet do? He said, no to the king, you know. Excellent, you know, commendable, but he says yes to the senior prophet and he goes to have a meal at the table. You know, scriptures say the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back and he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, So God is speaking to him when he's sitting at the table. What is God saying to this man who has just disobeyed? Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back 
ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your father. So basically, you know, he, um, uh, God is angry with him and uh, he states the consequence. So we read later on that you know, he died. Uh, and uh, there was a donkey that stood by the corpse and uh, the, a lion also stood by the corpse. So that was his condition. So what is it that we learn here about um, the prophet and moving in the prophetic anointing? See, the prophet, he did the right thing when it came to his ministry. Um, and uh, when the king asked him, he refused. Great. Part obedience. There was part. But what is it that made him stumble? Ministry association. Okay. So what happened? Just because there is a senior prophet, what did he do? He gave preference to his ministry association. To, oh, the senior is telling me. But what did God tell you? That's more important. Okay. So he gave second place to the word that God had spoken to him and he gave in to the ministry association. I don't know what he thought, but here's the point. You see, we can have successful public ministry. We can do all the right things as far as our public, uh, you know, our ministry associations are concerned. But you know what God really wants is personal obedience. God, what did God say? What am I supposed to do? That should take priority. Okay, And uh, it's a great lesson for us that even ministry association should not supersede our personal obedience to God. You look at the consequence that this prophet underwent. Was he well trained? Was he a man uh, who was uh, who who was you know developing his gift and flowing accurately in the gift? Yes, we check all of that off, and you know we really appreciate this man. But the mistake he made was that he was slack or he relaxed when it came to ministry affiliation and association. He did not try to double check. Oh, what is God saying? Even if my senior is saying this, what is God saying? What am I supposed to do? No, he did not do that. He, he just aligned himself. Uh, you know, that, oh, I must align myself to uh, this, this uh, minister of God. And unfortunately, there were consequences. Same thing holds true for us today. And so sometimes, you know, uh, unfortunately, people run behind ministries, run behind men of God, women of God. See, our, even our ministry affiliation and association must be of the spirit. Okay? Let's not try to make it happen in our flesh. Okay, with that, let me stop. Uh, if you have questions, um, your burning questions, post it on the screen page. But if you can hold on to the questions, then you know, we'll, we'll take it up in the next class. Let's close um, and uh, wrap up our class for this morning. Uh, I just leave it open to anyone quickly. Can you come in and please pray? Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. Uh, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that you're a God who speaks. God, as we are uh, listening to this classes about prophetic ministry, uh, help us to have this desire to flow in this anointing, Lord. You have given us this privilege uh, to work for your kingdom through this prophetic ministry. Help us to understand more about it uh, so that we can do great things for your kingdom. Uh, I thank you for all my classmates at Thank you, God, that you are helping us to uh, understand these uh, truth, these three truth in the Bible through Pastor Nancy. Help us to understand more about it. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. We shall connect next week. Bye for now.